the session on our inquiry on the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Two panels this afternoon. We're indulging ourselves on this St David's Day, pausing there. Very happy St David's Day to my fellow Welsh member of the committee and to anybody else with an interest in or any who's lucky enough to have Welsh blood yeah, anywhere yeah. near, their, near their veins. Yeah. On a sadder note, on behalf of the committee, or a more sombre note, on behalf of the committee, can I just send all of our thoughts, prayers and good wishes to John Caldwell and his friends and family after that inexcusable and unspeakable event uh, last uh, week. We all say it, but it is worthwhile rehearsing. Um, it was always a tragedy when the men of violence deployed their tactics. Uh, there is absolutely no excuse to do so in 2023. Yeah. And we wish, the, we wish him well, and of course, hope that the investigating officers of the PSNI and others um, very quickly bring the perpetrators to justice. And let us, if we can celebrate anything at all, then let us celebrate and mark the fact that uh, all of the party leaders together with the chief constable last week were able to gather uh -huh. and, and come out with a joint condemnation of this. At, at least that points in the direction that we're all facing in the same way. And it's only the, uh, the Luddites and the lunatics who want to disrupt and destroy. And a strong message. Absolutely, mate. Thank you, Jim. Anyway, we are delighted to welcome this afternoon Lord Bew and Tim O'Connor, who probably their uh, collective memory, thoughts and wisdom on this could probably take us through to at least the shipping forecast. But we will, uh, we will, try, we will try and keep to uh, a, about an hour for, for each session today, conscious of time. Um, so, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Let me, uh, let me kick off, if I may. Um, the Belfast School Friday Agreement is rightly regarded <coughs> as a significant achievement, both in ending much of the violence of the Troubles and in establishing a devolved government based on consensus in Northern Ireland. Do you think at that time, bearing in mind that we referred to a peace process, the foundation stone of which was the Good Friday Agreement, that over time um, the evolutionary iterative notion of a process has slightly been neglected and the, the agreement itself sort of slightly cast into tablets of stone, almost with the sort of totemic, unchangeable status of Moses's tablets of stone of a slightly earlier era. And, uh, Mr O'Connor. Thank, thank you very much, Chairman. First of all, can I thank you for the, the, the um, invitation. It's a great honour to be here with you and the colleagues. And could I also echo your uh, your very eloquent words about the, the terrible act uh, last week and to send our best wishes to, to Detective Chief Inspector Caldwell and his family. Um, I think it's a, you're, you're starting with an easy question, Chair. That's, that's, a, that's a challenging question. Um, I, I just, get harder, don't worry. <laughs> uh, I, was a, I, was a, an, I was an Irish government official, as you know, in, in yes. 19, so I joined the Department of Foreign Affairs in 1979, and I started working directly on Northern Ireland in 1986, and I've been involved more or less since. So by, by the autumn of 1997, when the negotiations were starting, um, I suppose the, the, the view, I think, you know, there's the old phrases, context is everything. So I think by the time we'd reached that period, because I, I do think we need to remind ourselves again, you know, that in, in the autumn of 97, we were coming off almost 30 years, and of course, Lord Bew will be, will be speaking very eloquently about, about all of this as well. But we were coming off a, a scenario of 3,700 deaths. I just did a little bit of maths uh, comparator for what that would be in terms of, say, Britain, pop, you know, the, the population difference. That would be the equivalent of about 130,000 uh, killings in Britain. You know, just think of a scale of that in a small geography. And your, your, your question about the process, I suppose what we'd had in the 30 years, of, starting with, I guess, Sunningdale in 73, 74, you had processed attempts. You know, Sunningdale was, was, was a brave attempt, but, it, but ultimately it failed. Um, and then, you know, it's almost like a decade and a bit later, we had the, the Anglo-Irish Agreement, which was a different kind of agreement. And it was obviously, it didn't involve the parties, the two governments. Um, but the big, the big deficit of the Anglo-Irish Agreement, obviously, was no involvement by the parties. So it was very clear that the next stage had to be yeah, the bringing the parties together. 
So, but there was a other significant shift. I think that what happened, and I'd be interested in Paul's view on this as well, is that up to the early 90s, the, the, the strategy of the two governments uh, had been <coughs> you work with the constitutional parties, you work effectively with the centre, and you do not uh, involve in any way parties associated with the, 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 the conflict directly. And that, they, that, that changed, and, and uh, Claire's party was, and John Hume uh, was, were very heavily involved in, in the, towards the late 80s, early 90s, in changing that. So the process, the, the process expanded um, um, to, you know, in the early 90s and by the time then the ceasefire came around. And I suppose what I would say then is the big difference about the Good Friday process, if I can call it that, uh, versus previous ones is that it was, it was I would say, um, it was comprehensive in terms of the issues on the table and it was inclusive, broadly speaking, in terms of the parties around the table, obviously... Uh, Mr. Shannon would know that not, not, not every party was around the table, but most parties were. So I think that what you have is the, the evolution of, uh, of, 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 of process and, and, and bringing in, as I say, the wider. And, and um, I think that um, the, the, we, we just about managed to get the uh, agreement over the line. It was, it, was, it was very, very challenging. We can talk about that. But then I think... Your, your totemic... Your that's to important to remember. There was no yeah. inevitability about there, it. Precisely. Yes. And there was, that's a very important point. And I would say, what was the mood, and, and, and Paul was there as well in the beginning, what was the mood this time 25 years ago, you know, March, um, February, March uh, 98? And the answer is that things were extremely tense and intense. And there was a, a famous, uh, uh, Claire and Stephen will remember, there was a famous um, Belfast Telegraph poll only maybe 10 days before where people were asked, did they expect the talks to succeed? And I think over 90% said they didn't. So, ex so there was no expectation of success. And finally, I would say, in this contribution, I would say that, therefore, the factor of agreement after all of that, I think that's partly why it took on the totemic, because it was, um, it was you, you finally had something where more or less just about you got everybody signed up. And I think that... To the, the fundamental basis of the agreement is obviously an accommodation between the, new, the two main traditions. Obviously, we've, we've, we've got now uh, you know, a more diverse Northern Ireland today as well. Um, and of course, Alliance was part of it at the time as well. But I would say that that, um, that, would, be the main, you know, that, that would be the main kind of piece, I would say. Thank you for that. So uh, the almost few, few, we've got this over the yeah. line. Everybody signed up. Right. Let's just, you know, don't touch it because it might break sort of thing. Um, recent polling, uh, numbers change and go, and poll is only, as we know, a snapshot in time. Uh, but recent polling would indicate there's a very clear, compelling majority of people in Northern Ireland, irrespective of which tradition they would, would, would associate themselves with, would vote in support of a Belfast Good Friday um, agreement. So given the fact that 25 years have elapsed... Do you think that there should be um, more acceptance of fluidity, evolution, and the ability to reflect changes in Northern Irish society? Well, I think Dr. Sir Robert will talk on in yeah. uh, later. Just very briefly, and I'd be interested in Paul's view as well. I mean, uh, two things. First of all, my old friend, sadly, passed also, Seamus Mallon, a great member of this house. He had a great phrase from that time that it's for each generation to write its own history, so that there is there is a bit of way that that you know yeah. um, the need to be able to evolve is certainly there, and of course it was it was built into the agreement. An important part of the design of the agreement was <coughs> the, the review clause, and and I suppose people ask me if you were looking back, uh, if you were looking back, um, you know, would you have done anything differently, and and. Um, I think the the biggest thing I say I would have done would would be that I think we underestimated perhaps the the challenges of implementation. I, you know that that I recall myself when we finally got it over the line, and then of course we had the referendum immediately yeah. after that, uh, and then there was a, a period of about another fifteen or sixteen months of 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 uh, stalemate and impasse before we got the institutions up. But once December 99 came and uh, the institutions were up and running, and I personally was sent to Armagh to be the first secretary of the North-South Ministerial Council, and my job then was just looking after you know, North-South. Everybody scattered to their own pieces. Yes. 
and we, I think, you know, we didn't actually understand that in many ways implementation is actually continued negotiation. Yes. And, and, I, and I think that, and so we have the review clause, we did build in, we did build in the, the, the capacity to be able to review, and I say if you combine that with, 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 uh, with, with Seamus Mallon's uh, victim, and the la but the, on the other hand, the, 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 the one kind of caveat is that you know, the, the, the Good Friday Agreement, the essence of it is the totality, how it deals with the totality of issues uh, on yes. a basis of accommodation. And if you start to pull at threads, that's the big fear, you yes. know. No, no, uh, I, I, and so I, I, that's the delicate design challenge, I think, of, but I think, you know, that th there is a rationale to what you're saying. But how do you do that without losing the yes. essence of what was so hard won? And I mean, you know, there's nothing we can do about history. I mean, but. Let, let, let me ask you to, to just give a moment's thought on this, that if um, the, the under, uh, underestimating phrase of the afternoon, if the sort of great flare-up of the Middle East hadn't occurred um, shortly thereafter, do you think the sort of review and evolution <coughs> processes would have, be, which, which then obviously took up a huge amount of bandwidth of, 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 of the Blair government, do you think that, that there would have been more review, more evolution at an early stage to get that embedded as part of the process? Yeah, I, I think we have to cut ourselves a bit of slack that because, as you said, we had no experience of success. We had no experience of what success looks like in, a, in agreement terms. And so I think we were all feeling our way. Yeah, yeah. It seemed like the right... And there was also a rationale to let the parties, you know, get on with it now. Uh, power sharing has been established. Uh, there was a bit of... I, I'm an old government guy, so, you know, governments step back now. Uh, and, and so that was... A, that was a reasonable rationale as well, you know. So there's a there's a fine line between uh, over you know be, be over over interference by by governments. Once you have set up power sharing, let it be. So these were delicate kind of trade offs. Yes. I think that yes. had to be um, that had to be. You know, I don't know, Paul. What what do you think about well, that? Well, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, everything that, that Tim has said, I, I recognise as uh, has been substantive. Uh, I mean, I, I do have a view that. Um, uh, uh, you couldn't. You were never going to get a situation where Blair, the Prime Minister, then was spending forty percent of his time in the first two or three years on Northern Ireland, and things things changed. But even up to the end of his premiership, there was a lot of engagement. There was a whole business of putting together a new deal between the DUP and Sinn Féin because the previous deal of principle between the Ulster Unionists and the SDLP, and structurally still reflects their thinking. Now. The, 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 there's a thing I, I remember uh, prior to the uh, agreement itself there was a framework doctor member talking to Sir John Chilcott with whom, I, with whom I was very friendly and everybody would say this is far too complex a document and he laughed and said and it can't people would say to him, it can't bring good governance and he would say that's not the point the point is to bring peace and actually that affects that's the reason <coughs> why. now I, against myself, I would say that towards the end of his life, <coughs> Sir John was now saying to me, well, it is time we aim for a bit more than peace and we want some good governance. I have to say I'm still, I would still give the same answer as regards these structures. The point is peace. There is no possibility, by the way, of changing the thing that causes the most gridlock, which is cross-community veto, because it's not just a question of what the DUP thinks. Sinn Féin will never agree. So there's just absolutely, it's wonderful, and lots of people I respect enormously write and have written in favour of, because of the frustrations of the last few years, we need to be looking at this a bit and changing this. There is actually just no possibility. That's, that's important, just a tedious but real fact, and it's not just because of the DUP. I also think at this moment it's unfortunate to go on about it, because people didn't go on about it when Sinn Féin bought down. The, the assembly to the same degree as they now do when the DUP have. Uh, um, and I think that it, 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 when they say, hello, you didn't worry so much about this or talk about changing the rules when Sinn Féin brought it down, they're actually being entirely accurate in that respect. Uh, and and uh, it, it, the DUP has a clear cut point in that respect. And the other reason why it's not helpful is that we are now at a moment where there is at least a reasonable and certainly a renewed chance of the return of the assembly. And, 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 and of, of getting it to work again. But I've never, to be absolutely honest, it's not just peace, it's community psychotherapy is the point of the thing. Mm. And I've never, I, I don't want to be too brutal, but I never really believed that devolution was about anywhere. 
was about better governance. Or there's not there are, there are political, psychological, communal reasons why you have to do it throughout the rest of the United Kingdom. It's very hard to point to results in education, health, anywhere, on the, which are superior to what was previously existent under an old style of Westminster government. I've actually just never. I, I do regard this as a political necessity which exists for political reasons, and in the case of Northern Ireland, the need for equality of esteem between the two communities. So I believe that anything would be worse. But the idea that, in principle, devolution needs to wiser or better decisions, doesn't, not just even in Northern Ireland. I've never expected good governance as such, particularly. Would you well, I do think you, you have the, the site of the two leaders or two communities working together is a top-down exercise in helping to reduce sectarianism. It hasn't cured it. It definitely reduced it, the form of the governance. I've just never believed or expected suddenly uh, creatures of the stature of Churchill and Ackley are going to appear in Stormont. I've just never thought that was ever likely to happen, and I don't think it ever will happen. But you can have a decent, uh, agreed form of government in which people meet together and discuss their differences. And we've done it. And to be fair to the DUP, as well as to David Trimmel's Tourism Achievement, we've done it for many years in Northern Ireland, and we can do it again. And, and it can be stable, and Northern Ireland needs stability. So the watchwords are peace and stability. That, you, that's, that's how I see it. I would do not be, believe in ch significant changes of the structures you, of the Good Friday Lord Agreement. You, Lord B, would you add as the sort of maybe third magic ingredient uh, apart from peace and stability, without wishing to denigrate either, um, but prosperity. Yes. Because prosperity flows from peace and stability. And if people feel better, if their pocketbook is feeling a bit fuller, if their quality of life is going up, if their life expectancy is improving, there's a more far more personal investment in securing the retention of the keys that unlocked access to stability, prosperity, and peace. I agree absolutely, and to say quite simply, the promise of this moment, which I think is real enough, is that you, you have the possibility not just of a more stable law now that actually works, but that, but, but, that, that, uh, but that clearly that relates to investment opportunity, or people's attitude outside to investment opportunities. And clearly there is very considerable uh, a pr promise in this moment. It may yet fail, it may yet be blighted, but I agree absolutely with the point. But again, that's not a matter of structures of the Assembly. Yeah, yeah. What, yeah. what matters is you have ongoing power sharing and stability, and people looking yeah, in from outside can see this might be a place to invest. Can I just add, Chair, one yes, please, because I think that's a very important uh, discussion you're having there with because and, and your own point about prosperity. You know, speaking as a, as a Southerner here, you know, the, that, the, the past 25, 30 years also, you could say, coincides with the most prosperous period in the history yes. of our state. Yes, yes, yes. Now, uh, you know, yes. but actually I immediately removed the word coincidence. It's not a coincidence. So the two are, shall I say, inextricably linked. Uh, and so you're making an important point there, building on peace and stability. So, in fact, our, our leading economic, um, our, our, our main business confederation, IBEC, has just launched um, a new campaign which, which actually underlines directly the, the connectivity between peace and, they call it, for peace and prosperity. So they're expressly talking about the interlinkage of the two. So that's a, that's a very, so, but I think I fully agree with Paul as well that peace and stability, and I think what we have to be careful is not to, not to underestimate because the change that, that was there from the previous 30 years to what's, you know, the, the past 30 years, I think we can't, you know, we, we just can't second guess that. Yeah. I, I've just been, I've just been thinking. We've we spent about seventeen minutes, and we've done question one. Right. So um, I, uh, and, uh, I, 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 I know about our time constraints. So I'm now going to turn to Bob Stewart. Yeah, I'm, my question is quite a quick one. Um, the De Hunt method, which we're talking about, you know, the method of government, uh, the sort of um, Jefferson method of mm. designing who the ministers are, committee chairs, etc. Um, I presume you would both of you agree that it was a good thing and has worked. And if that's the case, you both nod, my question's over. Mm -hmm. but I'd like to hear that. I mean, I, I, I am of that view. I mean, de Hunt famously was the answer to the quiz of naming a famous, pub quiz of naming a famous Belgian. 
and um, you know, Belgium. The, the, the Belgium. Belgium. It was Belgium. Yeah, That's what. what it sorry, it's a, it's a feeble joke. <laughs> it was a Belgium, like uh, but but, uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I, 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 we we both yeah, accept that. I mean, the chairmanships and so on. I mean, look, Stephen, for example, yeah. as Harry knows, a lot more about how these things worked out in Stormont than almost anybody living, but actually these things worked out reasonably fairly in Stormont, I, I, I would say. Even was an advice to Edward Carlson, I think, mm. at one point. Oh, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Should have seen my time. So we can speed up, really, because both of you are in agreement. The answer is yes, and therefore my question's over. We're on to uh, question I, I think. I think uh, yeah, thank I just, you. I would, I would, I was, uh, I'm sure, I don't know if the colleagues yeah. were there, but there was also there was a drama about it. You know, the, when the, on the first day of the, I think it was the 29th of November, 1999, uh, when De Hunt was run for the first time. Mm. And the way it works, uh, Stuart, is that the... Uh, the speaker calls first on, on the party leader, uh, you know, uh, based on the, the, you know, based on the number of votes, etc. Yeah. So, par party leader has to, and they have 15 minutes to respond to say, you know, first of all, what ministry they're taking and who is actually going to be assigned to that ministry. And nobody knows then, as as that goes along, what the, you know, what pick number five will be. It so it was a great it's drama. All fractional. There was, yeah, sorry. It's all fractional, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah. And you, know, we, you can understand. That. But we knew, we knew what that, 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 for instance, in that occasion, yeah. the UUP were going to have the first pick. Yeah. The SDLP would have the second. I think um, yeah. Sinn Féin at the third, and MDUP the fourth, and so on. And um, so there was a there was a power about it. There was a drama yeah. about it. I think as yes. well. Which uh, so Stephen's a bit fractional as well, is he? Oh, yes. <laughs> Sort of political equivalent of sort of a hybrid of Love Island and oh, naked yeah. attraction. Yes, but so, uh, right, there was one one year where, where it was done behind closed doors and worked out in advance. Yeah. Oh, I see. So there was a script all laid out and it all right. so was all about my clockwork. But I mean, I mean in terms of the script that's changed. So you the chance. <laughs> but I mean, mm. I'm just speaking back, Paul, really t to your point. Clearly, the um, imperative that both sides, if one can use that phrase have the parity of esteem as represented by ministerial office and so on and so forth. But in 25 years, the society and the linkages and the associations of Northern Ireland have evolved and changed. Do we not just sort of bake in the them and us? Well, odd the wire the them and us. <coughs> Look, for a, a long time in my life, particularly in the 80s, I didn't believe in them and us as a reality I wanted to recognise. I remember being very upset when my external, ex the external examiner <coughs> from the department I was in, Sir Bernard Crick, wrote an article uh, saying Northern Ireland faces both ways. And my obsession at the time in terms of uh, uh, was how working people should come together and so on and transcend these differences. It is not happening. It will not happen. We need to manage the, the, the fact that there are these two predominant identities and still are despite the increase in, in, in the alliance vote. And the advantage of equality of esteem isn't just the occupation of first and deputy first minister, it's the responsibility it imposes on the sovereign government yes. in the international agreement. And the sovereign government has to deliver when, the, when local circumstances don't, or has to work at it. There's no simple answer as to what it might be, but it has to try. And in the first instance, for example, recently in this parliament, we passed Irish language legislation to deal with, to use a phrase in that, in the, at the beginning of Article 1, Paragraph 5, the aspirations of a nationalist community. And that was passed here. Equally now, the Windsor framework respects the British government's work to say there was clearly alienation in the unionist community with respect to the way the protocol was working. We have now carried out a labour of work to, 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 to try and address that. So the formulations around equality of esteem, and I agree there's a part of it which is encasing the sectarian dimension. And for a long time I find it very hard to live with. But in real terms it's actually the best thing to do. And it has allowed what is not just dealing with the Irish language for the nationalist community, but it, because it is effectively the nationalist community most concerned about the Irish language and respect for it, it is the rationale for the United Kingdom government to say, we can't leave the unionist community in this alienated condition in which its identity is flighted, or feels its identity is flighted. And that's why so much work has gone in, for example, to the white paper here, 
as well as the actual text of the agreement. A awful lot of work has gone in, and it's on the basis of saying we have a responsibility under the Good Friday Agreement to do this. The bill was originally defended by the government on those terms. I, there is no not real basis for the bill, because quite a large chunk of it has actually been acted on and so on. But nonetheless, there is a labour of work carried on which, which, which is based on the fundamental principle of equality of esteem and what it means. And the sovereign government, no, people talk about it's a joint agreement. Actually, the UK government has far greater responsibility. It's a joint agreement with the British and Irish governments. It is an international agreement, but the sovereign government has the weight of responsibility which the Irish government doesn't have to actually deal with that particular aspect of reality. And they have really, really tried. Uh, as, as anybody can see yeah. from the text of the Windsor framework. Sure, if I could just totally uh, agree with that, that that's, I mean, uh, Lord Bew is touching, I think, now on, on a fundamental, because I, I know the focus of your inquiry is very correctly on the, on the institutions, but actually the institutions are based on the foundation platform, which is actually Article 1, which, which, which enshrines uh, these principles you know, of, of partnership, equality and mutual respect. And Article 1 doesn't, I'm a bit of a nerd now, it doesn't get the attention, I think, that it deserves. We both, which is, we both agree. We, we both agree, don't we? And you don't hear too many people talking about Article 1 5, but it gladdens my heart to, to hear <laughs> Paul say that because actually the Article 1 is made, has six parts, and if you think of it, six parts of a jigsaw, and all of which together constitute the new constitutional understandings, and they are actually fundamental to the, to the way forward. And Article 1.5 is rigorous impartiality, um, and, uh, and, and therefore, on, on both sides, and obviously now with, with all communities coming, you know, there, there's, a, there's a, a, a new diversity in Northern Ireland as well. But I, I would like to just totally echo the, the fundamental importance of Article 1 as the foundation stone of, of everything that we're talking about. And I, I have just okay. said that it is the basis for the very difficult, complex, serious work the UK government and moves it's made over the last year, 18 months. Uh, 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 that they've been acting in response to their responsibilities under that agreement, as they have stated a number of times. Yeah. However, it is complicated what we mean by equality of esteem. And one of the clear points is, you, I don't think there's any reason to argue that on the one hand you must respond to the alienation of a community, which they have tried to do in the case of the unionist community in recent times. But there's no point in replacing it with the alienation of another community. And therefore, to say um, we're not going to have a hard border, we're going to have a hard border on the island of Ireland, or there won't be access to special access to the single market, that too would not be in the spirit of yeah. Article One. Okay. Flouting and okay. treating with contempt, as so many people have done, the vicious unionist community over the last year, is not defensible under Article One. But to take the argument further, this is why we reached a terminus with this document because it can't be taken further. The British government has gone as far as it can reasonably be expected to go to address unionist aid, or it is possible to go. Uh, we're, the, the idea that, no, we just carry on, this hasn't happened. No, because the point is it can't go further. Yeah. Prime Minister Johnson said it about the, about the protocol. The point is to fix it, not to nix it. And what that means is, if you want access to the single market, which, by the way, a very large section, Perhaps a minority, but a large section of minority business of Northern Ireland wants. There are certain consequences, and you cannot totally expunge EU law. So you cannot take this principle, which the unionist community has rightly turned to and said, under the Good Friday Agreement, we want mm -hmm. uh, our alienation aspirations addressed, mm -hmm. as some kind of absolute that somehow the aspirations of the other community don't exist. Uh, and, and, and uh, so I'm, I just want to add that point. That's yes. why, in that's some way, we are now to terminus for a particular process. A particular moment in history is over. But isn't that a refreshing, um, or isn't a, re a refreshing um, change of tack from the Prime Minister, who has, who very clearly on Monday started to talk about judgments and balances and yeah. trade-offs, and this, rather than um, everybody can eat cake. Uh, no matter how much cake they want to eat, no yeah. matter what the flavour. Yeah, 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 I mean, this Prime Minister, that, but the phrase, I mean, to be fair, and because uh, I now hear it in everybody's lips, and uh, all parties in, in my own house, 
uh, the delicate balance of the Good Friday Agreement, we need to preserve it, and we're worried it's not been preserved, is in Boris Johnson's first letter to the EU. That's when it first appears. Like Paul to the Corinthians, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, it, so I, I, I'm simply reply, saying reply. that it is slightly, and, and by the way, Rishi Sunak has made clear uh, uh, that his predecessors, you know, he has completed, and with characteristic attention to detail and precision, he has completed a work which they actually began in substance. There is a fundamental continuity between the three prime ministers. Now, it's, we can talk about style and, and mistakes eight, made, made earlier. But this, uh, the other way I see it as the end of a moment, by the way, is that the 2017 agreement, uh, which is an international agreement, as Michel Barney insisted, the joint uh, EU-UK report of December 2017, was the beginning of a, of a kind of fairly disastrous collapse of the British negotiating position. As the Irish side subsequently was said, Ireland was allowed basically complete ownership of the of, of, of the interpretation of the agreement. Well, Bill, I, I, we, and and we, so we, we were ending that yes, moment. It's taken we could, time. We, we, could, but, we, could spend, we could spend a huge amount of time on uh, the, uh, the protocol, its fathers and, its, uh, yeah. uh, and everything else, but I do want to focus uh, in the time available to us. Um, we're covering quite. We've been covering quite a lot of territory um, already, so colleagues should feel free to sort of uh, chip in and amend and, mm. and demonstrate uh, fluidity. Um, I've got Jim Shannon next, or did you want to come in on this well, particular I, point? Robert? Well, I do, I do, because I've been listening carefully to two of the architects of the machinery of government, and I just wanted to ask about petitions of concern. We've heard reference to them this week mm. in the form of the storm and break, which the analogy has been drawn between petitions of concern and the storm and break by the yeah. Prime Minister. We know in New Decade, New Approach, the original purpose of petitions of concern was refocused quite properly, and there was a, an agreement that mm. petitions of concern wouldn't be used for to criticise ministerial conduct, etc. How do you square the, the grafting on of a new process with the approach in new, in new decade, new approach. Do, do you think there's a contradiction or do you think actually it's a reinforcement of the cross-community well, uh, principle? I mean, to, to be quite clear about this, the petition of concern and the, 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 the so-called assembly break is one of the key issues which means that, uh, uh, you know, this is on the upper end of unionist community expectation of this deal. And th so it is you know, I, I'm certain that the previous arrangements in this respect played little part in the decision to, to, that they're going to go for this. What it means, of course, is, uh, and what, in terms of the criticism in the unionist community or doubts, is it does depend on the UK government. So you need, at this present time, the brutal reality is the DUP could not alone trigger a petition of concern because they're five, I think it's five members short, with a few Ulster unionists they could. Um, and my point here is this, um, and the people are now in all that, is it as good as it looks, and there are now some DUP doubters of this. point is very simple. No UK government, if the Assembly is up and running again, and if, the, if there's a real issue, if it's some trivial point that's got up, a UK government will say, why is that? But no, tri no UK government, in the event that there is a serious issue at stake, something of substance of concern, which concerns significant numbers of citizens, is going to say, oh, we've got to we're, forget your petition of concern, we're not going to look at this, we're not going to help. There's, this is rather more than just what's in the document. Just think ahead uh, uh, um, to, to what is likely to be in immediate circumstances. The other circumstance is that it's not immediately obvious to me what's coming down the pipe either under this government or the next, is actually likely to create circumstances for it to be triggered, actually. It's not immediately obvious. So I think there is a defence regardless. It's, it's totally unpredicted. One of the many things about this agreement is the entire local intelligence media class didn't expect this. Uh, uh, much of the political class did not expect it. Um, uh, and that's slightly a comment on their ingrained habits of pro provincial self-regard, essentially, which is now communally cross-community in Northern Ireland, a very high level of same. Uh, um, you, you know, but nonetheless, one of our problems is that people not having expected it insist that because I didn't expect it, it can't have happened. 
you know, and that, that you could quite palpably hear that and you could read certain journalists and so on uh, um, because I'm a wise man who tells you what's happening here and all that and I hadn't a clue about this. Well, don't really believe that. Believe this isn't as good as it looks. And you could pick it up at quite a lot of what's written and said so far in the local media. Yeah. I just remember, I mean, I think that the petition of concern, the, the whole focus at back on Good Friday was <clears throat> about creating this delicate balance across everything. Check, balance, check, balance. So when I was uh, the secretary of the North South Ministerial Council, I did for five and a half years, I was the, working with my Northern Ireland colleagues, which was a, a great privilege. But I had a, I had a kind of a, a mythical um, sort of sign on my wall to the colleagues which said, our job every day here working is we manage complexity. That's what we do. Uh, and that was a kind of a principle. And so built into the design of every aspect of this petition of concern, the North, I mean, meet, meetings of the North-South Ministerial Council, just to give you a little pre on the design point, for instance, as part of the checks and balances and the, the complexity, because complexity is your friend, uh, in a conflict situation, actually, um, is that you, you had a, a scenario where um, the, the, the minister of, uh, of a particular uh, department was obviously either unionist or nationalist uh, in the early stages anyway, and they would, so to say the Minister for Education was Martin McGuinness. So when Martin McGuinness was appearing in the North-South Ministerial Council with, the, with their southern counterpart, they were, he was always accompanied by a minister from the other, uh, from the other, um, uh, from the other grouping. Um, and that, so that's one check and balance. And all decisions of the council had to be by agreement. Therefore, that was effectively a veto by a minister. So th what's that all about? Answer, com by true complexity. And David Trimble, again, sadly passed. Uh, he had a great phrase that... Uh, the Council of Ireland would have been regarded as what the element that brought down Sunningdale. Uh, and here we were now operating the North-South Ministerial Council, actually quite, and David Trimble was asked, you know, why, why the difference? And he said, because in, on Good Friday, in terms of North-South, we got the architecture right. And so I think that's a key, I would say that actually. So, so all of these dimensions, they're built in complexities which actually enable everybody to work then. And the other principle, by the way, that I had on my wall was no surprises. So managing complexity and no surprises. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I might go and start doing some needlepoint to have precisely <laughs> those things for mine. Jim Shannon. Well, thank you. Um, um, first question took 15, 17 minutes. This, this question took 20 minutes. So the rest of us can work out the, the figures how it works. I was short, actually, Jim. Well, you know, I'm only saying that. It's not me. It was made the comment. Everyone and, else. Uh, I've been criticised many <laughs> not being pithy, but I've realised that maybe I am pithy. You know. Uh, give, Lord, us, give, Lord, us, give us, give us, give us, give us a flavour of your pithiness, Jim. Lord, Lord, can we say what a pleasure it is to have you here, uh, mm. and and, uh, and and thank you for all that you do as well, and the conversations we've had at the airport. I've always enjoyed those, and thank you for them. Um, uh, uh, um, Tim, you mentioned about drama. My goodness, there's always drama in Northern Ireland. You know, and the fact agree, is, that it never changes, uh, and it yeah. won't change either for the future. Mm -hmm. My question is: um, UK government here has legislated on several occasions on the, the language and identity bill, as an example. Even though we and the DUP put forward that the Ulster Scots language should be uh, e um, given the same equal treatment as the Irish language. Uh, the, the, the government in charge decided not to be the case. And an example of that, by the way, uh, I, I asked for a frame of information in relation to the Irish language and the Ulster Scots been spoken at the, Ari, at the Northern Ireland Assembly. In, in, in the last um, term, the Irish language had £145,000 spent on, on that, and the Ulster Scots had £1,000. Now, you can see the, 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 the differential in very, very clear terms, and it shows to me that uh, that the government unfortunately here didn't uh, uh, equate the same or, or give the same equality that they should have given to the languages even though uh, we put forward that case. Uh, the second occasion of course is, uh, uh, is the abortion bill which they rode roughshod in this place over the views of the of elected representatives and thus of us who have <coughs> a very very strong tradition and belief in that there. Um, the third occasion was when Andathi's law, which incidentally we all, all the collective was in five parties supported, uh, and and therefore is an example of how we can put something forward here that doesn't isn't contentious uh, over what would be in a different way done. Uh, Robert uh, made the comment about the petition. Uh, I, I 
think it is important to have the petition of concern there. It it um, it gives them. Um, a, a security or perhaps a, 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 um, a methodology where both sides of the community can have, uh, if they have to and they want to, they would uh, uh, exercise that right. So I, I don't think you can ignore that. If he, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm following everybody else's example, Mr. Chairman. Well, then we want you to set one. Yeah, yeah well, I, I thought you might. Uh, the, the, the point I'm making, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, which is really, really important, and, 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 and I feel it's important anyway, I think nobody else maybe thinks that, but that's a guess, by the way. Um, you, Lord Bue, I think you've answered this question, but you put forward a very, very, stri a very, very clear case. And the case is that government in Northern Ireland, by its very nature, to move forward, and I was part of that assembly, by the way, in 1998. Uh, I, I, I was a supporter of that process and the way forward, and I agreed with it because it was the only way we could, we could move forward to have a political process that embraced all the political aspirations of those within in Northern Ireland. And, and, and is it right to say that there probably can never be uh, a, what I would refer to as a majority government like they have here? Even though that majority government, of course, in Northern Ireland would involve two parties from different traditions to make that actually happen, uh, would that be your uh, impression of where we are and where where the political process as we have in place now will always be the political process that we have? A majority rule really isn't possible. It, 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 I, I never say always. I'm saying for this current phase. That we're in, which is a well, I think a particular phase is over between Brexit, the early agreements, and now the sorting out of the early agreements between the UK uh, and, 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 uh, and the EU. So I think we're at the end of a, what is basically a five-year period, and you know it's a, this is just a new moment, decisively new moment. Uh, there are some people talking as if they can carry on. Uh, as if something major hasn't happened. That's not the case. Something decisive has actually happened, and we're in a new moment, and new rules are coming into, new, new contexts are now being created. We lived in, 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 in one set of problems essentially for five dreary years, mm -hmm. and it's moved on. Not perfectly, can't be perfect, but we've moved on as well as statesmanship can make it move on. So, yeah, I would never say never. There's still a part of me which harks back to the idea that, you know, of non-sectarian politics, um, you know, to which I voted a large part of the 1970s and 80s too. Uh, um, but I, you know, Bernard Crick was right. It does face both ways. It is hybrid. And there's, no, 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 and there's just no getting away from that. And currently now, that's the clue to understanding why you cannot say it, no tincture of EU law because I'm a unionist, any more than there are, there, are, there are EU law junkies in Belfast who are absolutely high on the supply of EU law, and any more that you can, you can, you can start addressing the unionist community from that perspective. So I just think irreducibly that's where we are. It faces both ways. There's an inevitable hybridity of, the, hybridity of society. Actually, most unionists accept that. The question is the terms. And for the last five years, it's been a perfectly fair argument, which um, essentially the UK government has accepted, and now the EU has, to a very considerable degree, accepted that these terms were not in balance, for, as far as Northern Ireland is concerned. And we're now in a new place. There will never be a perfect balance. I think the, the aspiration to have a majority rule, I mean, my, my former leader, Peter Robinson, always, uh, and, 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 uh, as he led the party some time ago, but he always was a... Um, Suggested, perhaps not always, but suggested that perhaps someday there may be a majority rule that that process, the political process, could be won. Yeah. I, I probably really subscribe to what you've said in releasing that, uh, and I, I'm not sure it's possible. I think that uh, I also just add, I agree with everything that uh, that Laura Beer said. I mean, I, I think that the, um, but but uh, you're right. It's it's really it's ultimately it's about trust and confidence, isn't it? And um, this agreement, you know, back 25 years ago, was was based on coming off the back of, of 25, 30 years of conflict that caused such death and destruction. So trust was, was didn't, practically didn't exist, and therefore you have to put together structures um, in the absence of trust and, and trust and confidence. And that's why, you know, when we were, you know, the principle of, of no surprises and, 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 and all that, no, 
eventually, I, I won't say, but one unionist minister said to me uh, one day after a meeting of the North-South Ministerial Council, which we had carefully managed so that there were no surprises, he said, we could have done that meeting by email you know, because, because it was so choreographed. Well, I, was, I actually took that as a kind of a good sign that we could actually start removing some of the... Um, um, but, but, of course, there, there, so I suppose you're, you're, the, you're the politician, Mr. Shannon. You're the, so I, I guess it, it, the call is whether, you know, at a political level, the, the level of confidence is trust is there uh, that you could move to, to that. And then, of course, I just add in Seamus Mallon's great you know, dictum that it's for each generation to write its own history. So... It's, Paul is saying, you know, maybe the time will come, but it's it's not there at the moment. I wouldn't would think. That's a pathetic question. Thank you, Jim. Um, Thank you. Mr. Connor, you, you mentioned no surprises, and uh, I think running through um, all of your, both of your answers this afternoon, and indeed all of our questions, is the basic assumption that it's the electorate who deals the hand of cards, and it's the politicians who then decide how they're played but it's the electorate who decides who their representatives are going to be. I'm going to guess here that you would concur with the proposition that the architects of the Good Friday Agreement and all of those who have been custodians of it subsequently would have subscribed to that view that in any electoral process it's the electorate who are king. So should, is it a surprise or possibly a shocking disappointment that we find one party uh, in Northern Ireland, it's a small party, but it's a vocal party, who appears to be saying, um, we will only support this institution if the electorate give us the result that we want. And we've heard recently, there's been clips in social media, which is, you know, um, we will never put in a Sinn Féin First Minister, but if that's what the electorate have voted for, and the numbers are there, should be, should be surprised, shocked or disappointed that people who stand under the banner of democracy, and, and, and let me just be absolutely clear, I mean, Geoffrey Donaldson, I think, has been perfectly clear that he'd be perfectly happy to, to, to do this. I, I, I think the DUP's position is clear and, and, is, and, and is supportable and is laudable. Um, but for politicians to then tell the electorate, you got it wrong... Shock or a surprise or a disappointment? Well, I suppose I could say I'm shocked or surprised, but I basically think it's, it's not, not even remotely realistic. Happily, I do not believe for a minute that is the position of the DUP. Oh, it's not. No, no I'm talking uh, about the DUP. Uh, uh, um, uh, what I would say... No, no, if, uh, uh, could, could I just add something Lord, to that? Lord, let me just be absolutely clear, because this is... Uh, uh, I, I think uh, no, no. I, 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 understood, I understood you exactly what yeah, you were talking yeah, no, about, no, and, no, I, and I did want to add something to that. Uh, um, you, you, two things, really, if this is all right. One is that we are moving before too long to the the major change between the May uh, uh, iteration of the agreement, which did not even mention the Northern Ireland Assembly. So this shows how major the Labour has been to deal with the democratic deficit and the changes that are now in place. Now, the Johnson withdrawal agreement does give a role, to, and it does mean there will be a vote before very long the Northern Ireland Assembly on the protocol. So we are heading down the road before very long to a democratic vote, and at the moment most people assume that particularly with these changes, some very substantive changes, there will be a consensus. Uh, and certainly a great majority of the people in Northern Ireland, judging by their electorate, won't accept that. And I wonder, do people fully realise, and we've passed a very significant moment, that if, you know, uh, there is no end, endless replay of these arguments available, yeah. because eventually there, is, there already is a very considerable closure. I would just say, I don't want to pass here, but just to understand, the reason why some of these arguments, and TV and so on, have got leverage is that uh, things were said by an Irish leadership which were unwise, so they don't have to misquote things that were said in 2016, 17, uh, uh, you know, in, and, uh, in the argument. And I understand Ireland's position. Ireland thought uh, Brexit was a huge threat to their real and legitimate interests. 
and almost anything was justified to, in terms of political process, to defend their position. So I understand how it happened, and there's no point in revisiting it, but things were said. They do not have to invent the people in that neck of the woods politically quotations which were unwise and look very bad today from Irish political leadership. It's only right to say that because they haven't got fuel from, you know, it doesn't just come from nowhere. That uh, there are places, which, there are things that have happened, which have, uh, which have gener- which unfortunately are part of the historical record. It still doesn't matter because your point is the overriding point, which I fully accept at this stage. It, that there is a question of the democratic will of the peoples of Northern Ireland. If I can put it like that, and we're very close to a definitive test on that. Mm. And how do you carry on this argument after that? Yes. I don't want to de- derail us too much because I think there there are uh, I think there's too much focus on on what I would characterise as the themans did it narrative because I think that the 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 arguments against uh, removal from the single market weren't just about uh, the possibility of 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 unrest and dislocation they they were primarily economic and, and, and practical but if yes. if you are placing the focus on 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 uh, comments by the Irish government. You know, was it not the chief constable at the time? Was it not, I believe, at this committee, perhaps MI5 and others, who, who set out um, the possibility of there being um, a disaffectation up, up to and including dissident problems? I'm, I'm just not sure about why the emphasis on the Irish government well, I, and others I, I, pointing I, out the same I, thing. I, I, and I think I, it is, it is a demonisation strategy. But nonetheless, it, it is true what I said, that that if you're Jamie Bryson, you, know, you Jamie do not Bryson have said to. Jamie Bryson said exactly the same thing. You don't have to invent these quotes. A week after the uh, and that, that's what I said. You don't have to invent these quotes, uh, uh, which don't look great in retrospect. And that, it's as simple as that. And if we want to understand why we're in a mess, that is unfortunately part. And I've also said I completely understand why the Irish government, uh, basically Brexit was destabilising for Ireland, and I completely understand why they hunkered down with, with you know, in, in the way that they did. So I'm not doing it. I'm not saying this to kind of raise problems with the Irish government. I'm trying to say that there's a problem of political management here for the Democratic Unionist but, but Party and mood in their community, which is not all a fault of their many inadequacies in the Democratic Unionist Party. They are confronted with a mood in their community which has been, to some degree, created by others. That's that simple. But, but it does, taking Ms Hannah's point, it does stoke a fire, does it not, if a whole range of people across boundaries and borders have said broadly, albeit in maybe different terms and using different language, but have said broadly the same thing, but then one only uses the gobbets of certain sources uh, to augment an argument. Yeah, but, well, I mean, uh, that's tr- that I, I accept that, but what you, you know, this is Northern Ireland, uh, and, I mean, uh, it is also the case that you can raise, uh, 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 you know, if I, I actually I'm, I'm trying to observe, because I think you are quite right, this business of not revisiting the past, the yeah. reason why, but you could raise a whole number of other things where the things that have been said by Irish ministers which don't have the contextual backing which uh, Claire has rightly given today. So, But I, it's not the game I want to play. What, I, what okay, I'm trying to say is there is a problem of political management for the Democratic Unionist Party in their own community, which is not no. simply a problem, not simply a fault of mistakes they may have made, but a mood that has been created by forces uh, it, this, this is not going to be... The worrying thing about this and, and the white paper, for example, which is an exceptionally detailed argument and should be read more widely, it seems to me, in Northern Ireland than it is in terms of its arguments. The worrying thing is that people will not decide enough on the basis of the content of the deal in front of them, which will have some flaws, by the way. They will decide it on the basis of communal balance, communal rhetoric, things that have been said which poke them in the eye. That's the really worrying thing, uh, and that's what I mean. Uh, and why I'm saying what I'm saying is to respect the task of political leadership, which is not an easy one for the DUP at the present time, because there is a sourness in its community which is outside, outside the the, um, the 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 actual issues that are dealt with in the Windsor framework. I mean, if I, just to add something on this, which is very important, people say, why do people carry out the, the attempted murder of the last few days? and it's non-political and it's just the joy of killing and so on. 
and I respect those who believe that, there is a very good reason why people do it. They expect, just as people sing, ooh, I up the IRA now, uh, in, in, in mainstream locations, in Dublin football teams or whatever, they expect that the people who did it expect that they will be sung about in similar terms 20 years from now. That is why they do it. They, 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 they do not do it just for killing or for the particularly cruel people or whatever. They do it because they expect retrospective validation of, 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 of their actions. That's why they do it. And that again, the fact that these mainstream events have happened uh, in, in terms of mainstream Irish culture means that you have a souring of the public mood quite outside the details, say, in this white paper, which makes this harder to do, to do what has to be done, has to be done here, but, uh, uh, you know. But I, I, just, I think you have to acknowledge the seriousness of the, of the task and realise we're not in a world where it's just going to be people looking through the Windsor thing and saying, oh, I agree with Pay, that's yes. 38 and not 39. We're not in that world. Mr. O'Connor, of course. Uh, just thank you very much. I mean, this, this is a, a very interesting discussion. I, I, I'm, I'm here in a personal capacity. I'm yes, not here representing the Irish government, obviously. But I suppose the only my comment back to to, to Paul, and that's the, these are it's a very powerful argument. I think what we can all agree is everybody's entitled to their view on 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 every matter. Um, we can all agree, I think, that, that certainly Brexit was a. As, as, as one colleague described it, a major disturbance in the force, you know, to use yes. Star Trek. And, and I was brought up on, you know, the, the, the Hugh Mallon doctrine of the two governments, basically. It's the two governments working as co-guardians and certainly 25 years ago. So I think one of the, one of the tremendous, uh, as was dislocations that happened after 2016, was, was, this, was this divergence of interests of the two governments and, and the inability to... And thankfully, you now we're, we're, we're back in, uh, in a scenario much more now and where, where the two governments working together that's a core doctrine here of, of everything positive that's been achieved in the last you know, 50 years, starting with Sunningdale. And then, um, so I think that, that we need to get back to the, the two governments work because they, they have this uh, common interest. And I suppose uh, you know, in terms of the, what happened last week, you know, we have to remind ourselves that the, the, the primary reason why we had a peace process was, was pre precisely to end the killing and to find a, a way uh, against the backdrop of, you know, the famous uh, Faulkner, Will, um, William Faulkner quote, uh, history is not dead, it's not even past. Uh, and, and here, we, so, so this is, this, this has, so trying to find a way to break that that uh, they, that's, that was the achievement of the agreement. And I, I totally, I think Paul is making a very important point when he's saying that actually to keep our eyes on that prize, the primary goal of Good Friday was, was peace and stability. And uh, it, it, has, it, has, it has achieved that demonstrably, not totally. Um, and now the other pieces have to follow. But I think at the core of that is the two governments working together. And hopefully we're, we're on that track now again, which I, which I deeply welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, the designation of other suggests, and, and I heard, I think we all heard Lord Bew, your uh, answer to, the, to earlier questions, but other suggests foreign, alien, different, beyond description, almost, isn't it? Other. Um, we know society is changing. We know the old affiliations are looser uh, than they were in a large swathe of uh, opinion. The um, diaspora of Northern Irish youth, um, as soon as they get sort of qualified, go away to university, to GB or elsewhere, don't come back, etc. Suggests a growing sort of anxiety and tension about all of that. Notwithstanding the need, the absolutely important need, to reflect in how the institutions are founded and based, how does one evolve Good Friday Agreement, the institutions of Stormont, the Strands, etc., to reflect the other and to actually find a better word for other, which, as I say, all the, from the start suggests alien, different and beyond description? First of all, I absolutely accept other is you know, 
spot on. I, I, we, and there must be on the middle, must be yes. ahead of the wit and van to do better. Non aligned, we could use, couldn't we? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm absolutely with you on that, Chairman. Can I say something? It's important to understand that while you have these two blocks, actually they have liberalised dramatically. And I mean, in the DUP block and the Sinn Fein block, both of them no longer believe things that were mainstream beliefs in their party two years ago. So the idea that what we've got is a system unmarked by liberalism doesn't actually understand the pervasive strength of modern liberal secular society, even within the DUP. I mean, and even within the Republican movement, which in its own way for a long time was a con con congealed little world of its own. So it, I, I, while I totally accept your point, and uh, the other is, 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 is an ugly term, uh, I'm totally with you on that. The, nonetheless, the, the, the way that we are going in Northern Ireland, the, uh, people shouldn't look at these blocks which, because they're internally changing quite dramatically as being a stasis or a staleness necessarily. They are already unrecognisable. I didn't think, and I was quite wrong. One of the reasons why I was so committed to what David Trimble was trying to do is I didn't think the DUP would pick it up and work it. Uh, because I believe they, they were so set in their ways. It's a nonsensical assumption on my part. I was totally wrong. And I'm just saying that in general, people do, they do not realize from outside how far things have, have actually, how far things have actually changed within the two major parties in Northern Ireland, the DUP and Sinn Féin. And the tendencies of thought within them are much more complex than they once were. So it's not quite as rigid and sterile. Mm -hmm. And they have possibly had the, they have, the prize for them both is, in a situation, I think in Belfast, 10% of the people weren't born there, something of that, it was certainly high. The, the prize for them is in the future now, whether the, either of them can actually get, generate support. I do not rule out that both of them are capable of being flexible enough to generate support from the communities, the 10% of Northern Ireland, Belfast people who are not born in the place, for example. Do not, rule, yeah. do not rule that out at all if we get stability. There's a, just very briefly, Chair, as well, there, there, in it, to, you know, to add to that, there's, um, the agreement itself also, though, provides for beyond other, it actually, so it, just to go back to Article 1.5 that Paul and myself both may refer to, uh, if you could just indulge me briefly, it says, affirm that whatever choice is freely exercised by a majority of the people of Northern Ireland, the power of the sovereign government with jurisdiction shall be exercised with rigorous impartiality on behalf of all the people in the diversity of their identities and traditions. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to say, of freedoms and discrimination for all citizens. Yes. So there is, there is a totality piece as well there, uh, recognised. Now, then at other points, it does talk about, the, in a sense, the primacy of of the two major traditions, but there is a nod to, um, yes. you know, to, to full there diversity. Is, but should, but uh, yeah, I agree with you. There's a nod, um, but should it be more than yeah, that? That's I a mean, reasonable I mean, question. I, mean, yeah. uh, yeah. I ask this as, as, as legitimately an open-ended yes. question. Is there a risk, do we think, of people who would describe themselves, who, who, who have to identify as other today, because that's the word mm -hmm. that's there, that they feel um, second or third class, mm -hmm. that their, uh, their vote and their views um, are, are not reflected by the architecture, mm -hmm. the foundation stones of the architecture, and therefore why bother, why engage? Is there a risk of people opting out if, 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 if the perennial compart uh, compartmentalization yes. continues? That's a, fair, that's a fair... I mean, look, again, it's back to the question of complexity, uh, and I yeah, suppose yeah. the... the, the, the Easy the, stuff. The, 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 the ch you, your own terms of reference for this inquiry are about the design, you know, and, yes. and w so back to the fundamental question, what was the design question posed? Answer, it was a contestation between two political philosophies, that that was the, the which of course was, was being expressed in political violence, That's the, that was the essential question we were trying to solve, uh, and, and so therefore, in a sense, the the, the, the plural, plurality of the agreement is, 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 is addressing that, but, you're, but, but that does leave the question that you're rightly asking, well, what about everybody else? Mm -hmm. So it's, that, that's a challenging design question, I think, that how, do we, how, do we, how are we going to be realistic in tackling the core fundamental contestation of two political philosophies sharing the same small geography? 
and how do we address that and at the same time not not almost codify sectarianism which is a, not another day um, yes. and at the same time but that's I, as I say the design challenge of, of complexity uh, and I agree with Tim and, and I take the force of your question chairman but just to be of some comfort there is no sign at the moment that people who consider themselves other are discouraged from voting it uh, turn out is quite you know uh, yeah. and just at this right. moment now I accept that this should be kept under review and is the Secretary of State right, he said it uh, to this committee, he said it on the floor of the House, that he stands ready to respond to, a, to grassroots initiatives? By that, I think everybody's broadly um, uh, translated that as meaning if the parties of Northern Ireland knock on the Secretary of State's door and say, we have to do something other than other. Um, is that the right approach, or, sh or, or uh, should this be more of a... Um, case industry, Westminster, Dublin, leading a review on it? Well, I mean, in, in, this, in a narrower sense, of course, he has just done with respect to Dahi's law exactly what he said mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he would do in, in bringing it here and not letting the, the issue get stuck in the mud. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, so he has done that. Um, no, it, 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 it comes back to my, 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 my simpler point. Just at the moment, people talk about the DUP and their veto on these institutions, which I hope will be ending before too long, uh, the, the, but the, um, because they have effectively, a rare thing in politics, had a campaign and got a result, the, 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 um, and then not a perfect result, but it's good, a better result than was generally expected, uh, it, but it is Sinn Féin as well, Sinn Féin will not tolerate any significant change in these current governmental structures? You just, we, you know, I, I know I think an imbalance in the discussion. People really are, are missing this completely. They will not tolerate any significant change in, 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 in these structures. Very uh, briefly, any any merit in joint first minister? Oh well, look, I, everybody there's agony in my house and in yours. Yes, it's yeah. got to be sort of, Everybody could see that this would a potential way out of a big problem. Uh, um, it, it, to be honest, if I was to say what I think, something we did get wrong in 1998 and, and that David got wrong, I think it should have been a joint first ministership from the start. It actually is. Yeah, it, it is, is a co-premiership. <laughs> and, and that should have been explicitly there right from the start. Um, I think if we were having it, I think realistically, if the agreement was being signed today, it would be joined first minister. Uh, and, I, and I think if I was to say there was a mistake in the original structure, that would be the one I'd see. And there was, you know, everybody was sitting Probably. in the house knowing okay. what the general election could, uh, both in your house and in mine, and, and tremendously tempted to say, let's just avoid all this now and do it now. It will, by the way, I am quite confident happen over the next few years because the pressure from all the parties towards it. Yeah. And in this instance now, the DUP, and it was the DUP's choice, it was DUP's old strategy towards uh, electoral changes in Northern Ireland, which underpinned this, because they wouldn't be in this position if they still had David Trimble's rules, because the Unionist voting bloc is larger. But they now have to, and this is, this is where you have to be, take your, you know, be an adult in politics. These are your rules, to a very considerable degree, agreed with Sinn Féin, um, and it's a embarrassing, but you lost under them, and you've no choice, in a sense, if I can put this, but to say, well, that's it. And anyway, it's a co-premiership. There's actually no loss of any material power. And by the way, the grace and dignity shown by such a move by the DUP will have a significant effect on the Catholic community, a part of which believes, unfairly in my view, that they're only, they haven't really got a problem with this protocol. Uh, at all, they've got a problem with ever having with having a a Sinn, a, a Sinn Féin first minister, and I believe that's unfair. So uh, there is a there is a it, it, you know, and on this occasion there's a great great advantage in what looks somewhat embarrassing, just by living up to your own word on these matters. But in the longer term, for co premier, it is a I, it's hard to justify having a co premiership which doesn't call itself a co premiership. It's something that. Brendan O'Leary, academic colleague of mine, has been saying for 25 years, he was right 25 years ago, and it's right now. Uh, um, that's my view. Thank you.
Um, I'm going to, unless uh, nobody has waved at me to um, come in on further questions, uh, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, yeah. My Lord, gentlemen, uh, Mr. O'Connor, can I thank you? Uh -huh. Oh, Claire. Just, just, just if it just uh, oh, uh, about right, that. A late, uh, a late eye catch. Oh no, I, I, th I thought I was already on, on your. Just on that uh, that that issue of of, of potential um, uh, rearrangement of, of of some of the, the protocols. Obviously, there is um, mechanisms within the agreement for 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 review and for um, good reasons and bad. People haven't wanted to open that up, and I think particularly. Um, uh, the mood over the last year, I, I would have had concerns, as would others, uh, about the potential to that that it wouldn't be sort of keyhole surgery, that it might be something um, something less, trade, yeah. less targeted, um, uh, and and hopefully uh, the wolf will be gone from the door if we're back in in a few weeks. But h how do you think that should be uh, best approached um, uh, uh, to, to 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 look at some of the protocols and some of the arrangements? You, you're correct um, to point out, Lord View, that there 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 certain wouldn't be consensus and there would be active resistance to, to evolving them from from some quarters but what do you think is the appropriate yeah. way um, to pursue that and we know that citizens assemblies are, are kind of both in vogue and 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 have demonstrated success um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in in the south do you think it, this would be the type of discrete issue that 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 could be usefully um, teased out in that way right. Good question. I, I think we're, you know, hopefully if we can move forward over the coming period uh, and everything and get, get everything back up and running again, um, I, you know, I think then there will be a question at some point coming up for, and it, the, 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 the review section of the agreement talks about, you know, that, that when difficulties arise, but I think it's a political judgment there for, for the two governments of the parties together to decide, um, you know, has a moment come where, because it, 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 isn't, it isn't written down, you know, exactly how that gets triggered. Uh, and I think people will be, for the reasons you've just said, I think there'll be a nervousness at one level uh, about doing that. But, but at the same time, it is provided for. So I think that's going to be a big political decision that lies ahead. Yeah, and there is a, back to Seamus Mallon's point, you know, it's, it's for each generation to write its own history. Question, therefore, 21 generation later, is this a moment to do that? But it's a fine political call that you're going to have to make. You know, the two governments and yourselves and the parties are going to, ha to have to make together. But, it, you know, it is, it, is it is certainly rational, but <coughs> it's, a big, it's a big political call. I, I basically disagree with Tim on that, Claire. I see what you're, why you asked the question. Thank you. Right, really, now nobody else has caught my eye, uh, so that is to the good. Can I thank you both again thank you. for thank you. Uh, your time? Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And for taking our questions. If you want to stay for the second panel, you're very welcome. I can understand sure. entirely if you wish to. Um, in the words of why don't you go off and do something less boring instead? But you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why don't you? Why don't you? Mr. Wishell, thank you so much indeed for joining us. We're very grateful for you for coming. Um, we look forward to what you have to say, and you've heard some of our line of questioning, and you would have heard the answers. And I noticed some nodding and some shaking, and I noticed some raised eyebrows. So I'm not going to ask you to give the rebuttal to what you've heard in, in sort of opening, uh, opening evidence. But the, can I just ask the three of you, and uh, I'm conscious now with, with a tripartite panel, uh, pithiness becomes ever more of a prerequisite. Um, just for your general overview, if, if possible, as to the relative strengths and weaknesses of the formation of government rules that we have uh, governing uh, Stormont, um, especially when compared to majoritarian forms of government such as Westminster. 
Nice start, sure. Go on then, why not? You're in the middle. I mean, I, I think when we're judging these institutions, this is something that um, Cathy Gormley Heenan uh, at Ulster said a few years ago in one of her public publications. It depends on the yardstick that we're using for performance that that determines the, the kind of judgment. And I think there is a lot to be said for De Hunt in terms of its inclusivity. It's very simple. We run it um, whenever our MLAs come to the assembly and you have your executive formed like that. And in some other power sharing contexts, it can take weeks or months to form a government. So there's something to be said for De Hunt in terms of its simplicity and uh, the speed at which we get a government. And there's also something to be said for it in terms of how representative it is. And this is something that we touched on, myself and one of my colleagues, Jimmy Pye, who's at, at Queen's University, we had a kind of mini citizens assembly on institutional reform about a year ago. People, particularly in a divided society, they like the fact that our coalitions are very representative of the different political traditions in Northern Ireland. But clearly there is a trade-off between inclusivity and efficiency and effectiveness. And the more parties you have in a coalition, the more difficult it becomes to coordinate it in a cohesive fashion. So it's very, very difficult to achieve um, collective responsibility in a Northern Ireland context. Um, that's not to say that our coalitions haven't worked, I think, during the pandemic. The first few months of COVID demonstrated that large multi-party coalitions in Northern Ireland can work um, under difficult circumstances. In those first few months, I thought that the, the executive performed reasonably well. And then there was a public opinion poll, I think in June or July of 2020, that was covered in the Irish News that showed that two thirds of the people in Northern Ireland thought that the executive was handling the pandemic well. Um, and that was a good news story because there was other governments that weren't these large multi-party coalitions that weren't getting that kind of press. But then towards the end of the year, the wheels started to come off and ministers were disagreeing with one another, almost in public, um, about public health regulations. You had use of the St Andrew's veto to override the health minister. So we saw in that year the best and the worst of De Hunt. It can work but it's very, very difficult to work. If we take Lord Bew's point that um, devolution has done some things, but it hasn't led to a qualitative uplift in terms of political outcome for the electorate, um, would a executive versus opposition potentially address that and deliver improved policy outcomes? Or is it just, or, or is there sort of, <laughs> acceptable strengths, I suppose, in this continual finding of a balance, which may mean that the optimum isn't actually arrived at, but it's something which nobody shouts and screams about, and therefore the sort of the middle way is always identified. I'll, I'll say something briefly, and then I'll pass on to my colleagues. I think because our executives are um, so large, you know, with De Hunt, everyone and, and their grandmother gets to be in the government, um, we tend to judge them in terms of whether or not they survive. And when the mandate lasts a full term, there's kind of muted applause that it has lasted. And I think that means that there's less focus on public policy outcomes and less focus on um, whether manifesto pledges have been um, implemented, for example. And if the executive was more streamlined yeah. and you had fewer parties in the executive, I think you would see a stronger focus on policy and on, on outcomes. As it happens, you know, the most if we're judging governments by it being cohesive and all of the ministers singing from the same hymn sheet, uh, one of the slickest operations we had was the two-party coalition between Sinn Féin and DUP, very short-lived. It was engulfed by a scandal after about seven months. But few before scandals. that, well, a few scandals. But before that, it, it was a very slick operation in terms of those two parties working together. And they did seem to shift the focus of away from not just the parties cooperating, to delivery. Um, so there is something to be said for a streamlined executive in terms of a stronger focus on, on public policy. I'll pass it on. And so just before you leave that, uh, it, by definition, therefore, if it's very hard for people to say no to anything, 
and it's much easier to say yes, but with various degrees of gradations of volume in the saying of yes. Um, does that lead inexorably to a compounding of budgetary problems and the, and, 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 and the likely overspend because one, one group or another has a great idea and I've said yes to the other three so I've got to say yes to him and, or her and therefore spend, 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 spend in order to placate? I think so. I, th I think because there's the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, they don't have any power or authority over any of the other ministers, they so they can promise the world, yeah. and there's no consequences yeah. for that uh, unless there's a... It's very difficult to remove a minister from office, you can, if there's a kind of cross-community vote. But ministers can operate their departments kind of like silos and promise a lot. Um, and I think that we can relate that to the structures of, of the system of to to haunt. Um, but I know political futures, it's something that was raised in, in Alan's um, submission, have looked at things that could be done better to focus our public policy making more on outcomes and budget and so on. That segue is possibly pretty well to yes, advice. In, indeed. I mean, as Paul View was saying, you know, the, 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 real, the, the, the first issue that had to be tackled, that the agreement tackled, was getting an acceptable form of government, and that depended then on a high level in, of inclusivity and I think it still does. Now, you can argue whether the given changing voting patterns, the way society is moving, whether the rules are exactly right, but we are, I think, going to get, have to go on having a, a, a government that, that, that brings in support across the community. One of the things that, that particularly worries me about that, though, is that the, the absence of focus on good government. And in 1998, you know, we we did not think about this very much at all. I think we probably allowed ourselves to be lulled into the feeling that if we got a, a, an inclusive government established and with all the goodwill from all around the world that was coming in, it would do, it would do heroic things in government terms. And it, it has never quite worked and a great deal of reform has been blocked and it's never entered particularly into the culture uh, that we have to do government well. So I'm the last executive never established a program for government at all. You know, you have this system thrown together by an algorithm, uh, people with no necessary ideas in common. They're supposed to come together around a program for government and then, then work on that. But it, it hasn't entered into culture. There's never been public or political or media traction behind those sorts of processes. Uh, and one of the things that I think needs to be... This, this needs to be addressed because it leads to the executive constantly under-delivering, and you know, you look at the state of the health service now, but also infrastructure, productivity, so many things. Uh, we, 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 we need, I uh, hope devolved government can be, can be re-established in the near future on the basis of the protocol, but that will not suffice to deliver stable, effective government. Uh, and so we need to think more in those terms. Just to say, in general terms, it's very welcome we're having this discussion because the discussion of the, of, of the institutions is not very fashionable and thought to be sort of rather geeky. Yes. I think we're all people who think geekery is, uh, is, uh, is, is heroic and, and, and absolutely essential to, to, the, to, to the public well-being. So uh, glad this discussion has been kicked off. be a new sort of superpower, geekery. And well, absolutely. Yeah. Well, the, the, you know, with revolution of the nerds in Silicon Valley, and, yes, and, and right. you know, we're, we're right. superheroes wherever we go, really. Um, uh, but uh, it, it would be, be nice to see this discussion being continued after your deliberations, which have elicited quite a lot of valuable uh, written com community contributions. I think. Professor Rennie? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, can I start off maybe just by saying that I'm, I'm perhaps the odd, odd one out in this panel by not being primarily an expert on Northern Ireland. So I'm an expert on democratic institutions and public attitudes towards democratic institutions. Uh, and that brings me very much to thinking about Northern Ireland uh, and I've done some work recently on Northern Ireland um, because it is important, as Alan is suggesting there, that uh, those of us who are not primarily experts on Northern Ireland engage and think seriously about what's happening in Northern Ireland and, and how the system can work as well as possible. In answer to your question, um, I don't disagree with anything that uh, the others have already said. We, got, we, we uh, geeky uh, political scientists, refer to the Northern Irish system as a consociational form of a system. And a consociational system is used and is necessary if there is a divided society. So a system in, in which you have power sharing uh, and guarantees for uh, different communities. Um, consociational systems are hard to run. 
it is very tempting, I think, for those of us not brought up in a divided society and not used to life in a divided society to want to imagine that it's possible to get past the difficulties of a consociational system. Um, but it's necessary uh, mm. in a divided society. There are no shortcuts to successful democratic governance in, in a divided society. And I agree absolutely with what was said earlier and what uh, others have already said, that it, um, the evidence seems very clear that Northern Ireland remains a very divided society and therefore at present it is necessary to have this very frustrating, complex system of power sharing. But let's just pause there for a moment because divided, yes. Now you can have, you can have peaceful division and then you can have violent division. We, you know, we're, all, we're all aware of that. And there's been a, a, a long transition and we're running an inquiry in parallel to this uh, with regards to the continued uh, presence of paramilitarism and organised crime and so on and so forth. So none of us are naive on this particular point. But when and who identifies the time when one stops to say, we, desi we, we designed this system as a principal vehicle to deliver peace. And that is broadly held, and nobody seriously contemplates a return to, in inverted commas, the bad old days, close inverted commas. We compound the Northern Irish exceptionalism. We hold on in sort of folk memory to the bloodied divisions and perpetuate them in the modus operandi of governmental formation that we have today. Now, Professor Renwick, in, in your experience, when do those societies make that psychological change to say, we needed this straitjacket to stop us shooting each other or chopping each other to bits or blowing each other up or whatever? We don't need that anymore. We need something else. It's a very good question. It doesn't happen suddenly. No, no. I, 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 it doesn't happen in one jump. And sometimes it happens without people particularly noticing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the institutional change happens not through a formal institutional change, but simply because certain institutions that have been put in place gradually decline in their relevance. And they are used less over time. Mm. They seem to be less important over time. And eventually you think, gosh, that, that thing... It's not really being used anymore. Um, and, you know, the, so the, the theory of consociationalism was developed first in the Netherlands because the Netherlands was a very, very divided society. We don't think of the Netherlands as yeah. a very divided society these but days. But they were, yes. Um, but the system just kind of gradually changed in how in practice it functioned. Uh, it wasn't that someone suddenly decided, OK, now we don't need to have consociationalism anymore. It just gradually changed in its function. So it seems to be, I mean, you're absolutely right that there are dangers that some things become entrenched and yes. become barriers to yes. um, society moving on. Um, but it's also the case that some elements will kind of evolve away naturally. And um, I mean, it seems to me looking at uh, the, the situation currently in Northern Ireland, and, and so a lot of my thinking on this is based on some focus groups that we ran last summer when we, we explored in depth um, how people how ordinary people in Northern Ireland uh, think about these issues. It seems very clear to me that the kinds of sectarian concerns that led to the creation of those institutions 25 years ago are still there and, and need to be respected and need to be understood. Mm -hmm. Can I come in on that, sir? Uh, briefly, I want to be Mr Walker. Uh, yes, Dr Hoggy. No, Dr Hoggy, yes. yes. Oh, okay, Walker. just... Agree absolutely with with Alan there, and he, what we we talk about that in political science circles is the exit dilemma, and I think the committee had a written submission from doctors Joanne McAvoy and Alison McCullough, yeah. and Alison has written about the exit dilemma in power sharing systems. In some systems, as as Alan said, the mechanisms become used less and less, and the system kind of evolves and changes and grows. It looked like that was happening with our system. If you think about the reforms that happened to the petition of concern with new decade, new yes. approach, and then it never got used again. So the restoration of devolution the last time seemed to be about suppressing the petition of concern. Now we're talking about the restoration of devolution, and crucial to that is the petition of concern. concern. Yes. So swings and roundabouts. Right. 
transit pass it for him. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Walker. I'm just really interested in this, um, uh, addressing this dilemma. And certainly a few years ago, there was a general mood that um, you could continue with a degree of consociationalism and the, the arrangements and the balance in place whilst also developing a stronger opposition um, within um, Northern Ireland. Uh, are there other systems that you've studied where that has, uh, has been, de been able to be developed in terms of being able to d d develop, uh, ma maintain a balance between divided communities and, and, and build up um, the role of uh, an opposition? And of course, there have always been parties represented in the Assembly who aren't represented in the executive. Um, they are the minor parties um, at, 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 at present. But do you see an evolving space for um, more of uh, an, an opposition? And then, I guess, partly related to this, we talked about the exceptional circumstances in Northern Ireland. You know, one of the things that struck me during my time um, in the Northern Ireland office was um, the extent to which um, that extends way beyond Stormont, also into the role and function of local government. And, and did, did have any of the panel looked at you know, whether there's more opportunity for perhaps normalisation um, in local government um, than there might be in the Stormont um, uh, structures? Uh, not an expert. In, I mean, uh, local government, I think, my impression is, I mean, others are much closer to it than, 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 than me, but local government now operates rather more effectively in Northern Ireland because some councils ran on a rather majoritarian basis and increasingly there has been a move towards power sharing mm. uh, and that probably permits them to be more, more effective. I mean, it is still the case that in Northern Ireland about 80% of voters vote for parties that are drawn predominantly from one or other section of the community uh, and that have a very diff different outlook in principle on the constitutional destiny of Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've not moved too far away from the... Now, there has been a, a, a great growth of the other category, or whatever you want to call them, the centre ground category. Uh, and at some stage, the system, I think, will need to, if, if that continues, will need to adapt to accommodate that. And that, you know, there, there are points if, for example, a person from that category became first minister or deputy first minister, it would uh, uh, unbalance the system entirely. Uh, now, ideally, we should start having the discussions about how to do that uh, 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 and bring it into public debate. And on the point of op about opposition, I mean, I think there's no problem in having an opposition if it's a voluntary opposition, if you like. <laughs> so if people choose to go into opposition, uh, the difficulties arrive, arise if... Uh, there's a feeling of exclusion uh, from some parts of the community and I think you can only um, start to uh, tolerate that kind of circumstance if the, the, the degree of um, uh, division within society is, is less than it is today. Um. I think I'm going to Robin Walker now. Are you on, uh, on, on, I just on the other designation? Or? Uh, no, in which case I must be going to Sir Robert Buckland. Thank you very much indeed. Um, easy to confuse Robin and Robert. Um, I, I, was I, was trying, I was trying to, I was trying to um, uh, define the uh, myriad Robert messages coming from the whips about uh, votes and oh, whatever. Right. So. Three Robins and a Robert. Uh, three Roberts and a Robin. Um, I'm listening very carefully. And Dr. Hockey, I think, echoed, echoed the point I made to Lord Bew earlier about petitions of concern, um, that there does seem to be potentially a contradiction between New Decade and New Approach. I think, I think what struck me about New Decade and New Approach that was that, once again, it was um, you know, UK government ministers bringing together the parties, setting out what looks like a very credible and decent programme for government. But I think the subtext of what you're saying is that you know, true peace is more than an absence of conflict, and it is reflected by political parties and think tanks coming up with their own policies without having the NIO to help them do it, Frank. And that, that's not me being in any way patronising, because I know there's, there are plenty of you know, people in, in Northern Ireland who've got lots of ideas and who want to see policies, homegrown policies brought into, into practice. When do you think we're going to get to that stage where we can focus upon policy and not process, which you know, still dominates the debate in, in a way that I think a lot of people find very alienating, particularly people, you know, on the ground who are trying to run businesses or provide services. I, I think it needs encouragement. 
Uh, I think there does need to be a culture change, and I think that the, the governments could well take a role, the British government particularly. Um, new decade, new approach, rightly, and was focused on the economic and social things that were going wrong, but generally the, the, the prescription was draw up more strategies. Uh, now, people get rather cynical in Northern Ireland about, about strat one, one, one wag I, I heard remark say, you know, once we built ships, launch ships, now we launch strategies. Um, uh, launching a strategy doesn't actually guarantee that things on the ground are going to change, and a lot of the failing of the executive, I think, has been in the follow-through. They have, you know, they, they, they announce a plan in outline, but then when it comes to the difficult decisions, often health reform, for example, uh, that are involved in implementation, uh, it, it rather falls, falls behind. And, you know, the, there isn't the great political or media or public pressure on them to, 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 to keep doing these things. So I, I floated in my, my evidence the idea... You know, I was involved in setting up the think tank Pivotal, and that was very much uh, a part of our mission to bring more focus onto, onto, onto uh, public policy issues. Uh, and there may be room for a, for a, for a statutory body. I and mean, the Fiscal Council is doing a lot of rather good work in, 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 in elucidating these issues and a body that would, would ventilate them, um, uh, uh, bring them into public discussion, possibly draw up draft pro programmes for government and, and longer-term visions. The programme for government is only five years. Uh, and, and measure implementation, which is not to diss private think tanks because I, I think there is scope for encouraging... Uh, a, a sort of mixed economy there, uh, and, uh, and, and a range of ideas. But I, I do think, I, sorry, I've said this before, I think, but I do think this is essential to future stability. We, we, we must have a government that, uh, that delivers, and it will rise in public esteem, and will therefore be more difficult to topple, and, and it may be less disheartening for the people who are working in it as well. Yes, and, and, and it's interesting to note that, sadly, the Northern Ireland Law Commission has not been operational for nearly 10 years now, and that's often a generator of good law and law reform that can be then taken on by uh, the parties or on a cross-party basis. Could I just add, in, in response to your question, that um, one of the most important requisites for uh, overcoming communalism, sectarianism, is trust. Uh, and we have been through a number of years now that have not been very good for trust. Uh, you know, Brexit clearly has, uh, whatever you think of Brexit in itself, has led to a great distrust. Mm. Uh, the actions around the protocol have, well, before the, the, the most recent ones, uh, uh, led to great distrust and a sense of betrayal. Um, the, you know, f speaking very frankly, the government in London is almost universally, uh, sorry, the Johnson government in London was almost universally distrusted in Northern Ireland. If that's the context, it's, it's very difficult to start to overcome these divisions. Uh, so a period of trust building, and as Alan says, a strong focus from London on understanding its role in building trust and ensuring that it's engaging positively with all communities in Northern Ireland and not treating Northern Ireland as a football for other games is fundamental to progress here. I strongly agree with that. I mean, it, it has been... As, as do I, for what it's worth. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it, there was never perfect trust in the British government. Yeah. Uh, people were rarely um, coming out in the streets to, 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 to declare their admiration. But uh, uh, governments worked very hard, and of course worked very hard in, with Dublin, and the, 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 the London-Dublin partnership is cru has been crucial to political advance, and I think we still depend <coughs> on it uh, uh, to help drive political advance. So those are areas that I think really do need serious remedial work. Thank you. Thank you. Robert, anything else? No, thank you. Uh, Bob Stewart. Um, Talking about possibility of reforming uh, institutions, how do you think government of Northern Ireland could be reformed to make it more stable? It's a million dollar question. Yeah. Um, you, can only, you can answer this in three words only. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hockey, do you want to kick off? 
I mean, it depends on the extent of. Let's make the assumption that you yeah. could, someone might agree to reform it. Yes, we're trying uh, yeah, to. You know, we're making this slight assumption. So how could it be made better? Well, there is strong public support for reform of the institution. So I was involved in two research projects. One was a kind of quantitative survey, public opinion. The other one was a mini public, and we that both of those projects touched on institutional reform and. If I had have been um, in conversation with Lord Bew earlier on when he was essentially saying, you know, we can't reform the institutions because the DUP and Sinn Féin won't allow it, the public disagree. Mm -hmm. The public don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. There is strong... Younger the public. Pardon? Particularly younger members yep. of the public. Yeah. There is strong cross-community consensus that these institutions need reform. That consensus kind of dissipates when you ask about the extent of that reform. So whenever we kind of... Uh, dove down into these issues with our, our mini public um, last year. The first part of the day, people had very many criticisms of the institutions and had yes. didn't have a lot of good things to say about mandatory coalition. But in the second half of the Citizens' Assembly, we explained the kind of basics of a more voluntary coalition. Mm. And that did make some people anxious. People who previously in the earlier part of the day were very critical of mandatory coalition when we said, well, what about the prospect of a voluntary coalition? We're anxious about that idea and we're asking, well, is there going to be cross-community safeguards? Only these people, the fundamentally younger people, uh, the key reform they would want is so that government cannot be put into the cupboard. And, you know, so the key reform they want is you cannot have Stormont suspended and it, government has got to go on. So that's presuming the first reform they, they would want, I assume. A removal of, of the veto, I think, it's in the current circumstances, it's, it's easy to make that case. There will be political resistance to it, as Lord Bew said, and yeah. there absolutely will be um, resistance to that. But that's not to say that removing that veto means removing all of the safeguards that we could put in to ensure you know, equality between... The communities um, we can reform the system and keep mandatory coalition so there's tinkering around the edges that we could do um, so if you I think this was raised in a few evidence submissions submitted to the committee if you throw in the first minister and deputy first minister with the hunt mm. rather than the process that we use now so that if it was chosen by the hunt and the DUP or Sinn Féin said we don't want to nominate the opportunity would just pass to the next qualifying party so that might resolve that issue. Um, and that is the primary critique or the primary concern that people have with the institutions. When we ask people in our mini citizens assembly, what do you not like about it? It was about ransom politics and instability. And at the end of the day, uh, we ask people, what is it that you want most from your government? And people might think that they would say reform of the NHS or better public services. By far and away, people said stability. And that's could, you, could you say that again? Stability. They said they want stability. stability. Yeah. And that's a pretty basic expectation of one's government. Yeah. But such has been the instability that that's what people are crying out for. And existence. Stability in being in existence yeah. is what you mean. Yeah. I was going to say government stability, stability in includes having a government in place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, the great disincentive yeah. of that, I mean, I, 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 I think mm. uh, Mr. Stewart's right in, in his sort of question and again sort of highlighting on the youth but whilst the main unionist party and the main nationalist party control I mean potentially on a greater pendulum effect but you know do very well out of this system top dog and second top dog or joint top dog there's no incentive for them to change is there? Why would you break the model that rewards you? Or change the model. I mean, break is a break is the model. Change the model. Evolve the model, which may see you possibly be on the opposition benches. So, we, sorry, uh, uh. no. Which is why I think we, you know we, we need more discussion of the possibilities here, mm. uh, and I think you know increasing the the, the increasing vote for centre ground parties. Mm. Uh, other parties may well reflect that sort of. So would you think it was it was better for the Secretary of State? to convene discussions around this rather than respond to requests if one, if one accepts the 
if we're doing frightfully well out of this, let's not bother changing it because we might not do as well as we are. Well, look, I, I think in present circumstances, uh, and the Secretary of State probably has slightly more urgent things to do than... I'll suggest uh, he does convene. it tomorrow. But, uh, but uh, no, but uh, the... It, I think we need to start the discussion on how the system may evolve, and from that p pressure may may begin to emerge to do it. On the question about how you restore stability g generally, that, that is a very big question. I don't think the answers are primarily institutional. It is about culture. It is about, as I suggested, uh, you know, restoring some of the hope and momentum of the agreement and the other things that the agreement was focused on promoting reconciliation, dealing with the past and so forth, uh, uh, those underpinnings which are really vital to stability, ensuring policing by consent, really need to be, to be looked at again and progress has stalled uh, and the public has become to some degree more disenchanted and needs to be revived. On the question of what you should do to break deadlocks, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to do, do institutional reform, in, 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 I think, other than by, by cross-party consensus, because the, you know, the agreement was, uh, was agreed by a large measure of consensus and, and approved in referendums. But if the deadlock continues, then I think there is a strong case for the government, on a temporary basis at least, to decide on changes to the institutions to permit government to go on because there, there is no agreement compliant method of delivering government if the institutions don't, don't function as at present. And it, 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 I, I, I come back to this point, it is absolutely essential that government is done. Uh, and the civil servants can't do it. Okay. Uh, they can't deal with the longer term issues. So uh, I, if, you know, after the local government elections perhaps, we don't quite quickly get back to government. I think they, uh, uh, to, to, to a devolved government. I think there is a strong case for tweaks to permit the institutions to resume, with some parties in uh, in, in, in in opposition, while discussion goes on uh, about uh, about longer term uh, uh, reform. Um, uh I just don't think I've just been looking at messages coming through from the Whip's office. Votes are expected shortly. Um, I think we're expecting three votes. Um, what I'm quite keen to do, uh, if we can, if we can't, we'll come back. Is, but just to try and draw this uh, to a conclude this session, this panel session to a conclusion, um, a couple of minutes after the bell has rung, okay, mm -hmm. rather than keeping you three waiting and yeah. uh, 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 anything else. So I, I'm going to, Robin, had you tried to? Well, you, yes. Uh, I mean, it was just on this. Sorry, point. forgive me, Bob. Had you finished? Sorry. Yes, I have. Thank, okay. Thank you. Uh, Robin. Um, it, it, it was just on this point of, of possible uh, re re reforms that you were talking about before, you know, coalitions of the willing being talked about in the past and, 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 and so on and so forth as arrangements forward. The current arrangements clearly do in some way discriminate in favour of the two main groups versus those who designate themselves as I other. Rest and we have seen that other group emerge as a stronger force in, in Northern Irish politics. At the same time, we've seen the concept of Northern Irish identity growing. Um, versus people who identify as Irish or British. Uh, and so is, is there an argument from that perspective about looking at um, offering greater influence to parties that designate as other um, and allowing for reforms that would, that would give them a greater role in the structure whilst maintaining some degree of balance? And I think to, to the points that Alan Rennick has made about the importance of having a balance built into the structure. Well, I think there are absolutely very strong arguments for, for, for that in, in principle. The politics of doing it is, 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 is different. But, I mean, the, 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 the agreement is basically you know, founded on the assumption that there are two tribes in Northern Ireland and, and this is all that really matters. Um, and, 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 you know, we, we have moved on from that quite substantially. And the voting rules in the Assembly clearly discriminate. Uh, they don't give the veto rights to, 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 to people from the centre ground. Now, what you do about it is, is uh, without creating even greater obstacles to decision making uh, within government and within the assembly, is, is, is a, more, a more complicated question. Uh, but it's one that should certainly be addressed. But, but on, the, on the, the process, Robin, I think, and this is, kind of speaks to the previous question as well, there is low hanging fruit here in terms of getting, keeping this conversation going. But in different guises, we've come back to this idea of reforms may be desirable, but there won't be the political there, will there to, to implement them. The government could establish the civic advisory panel that all of the parties wanted uh, with New Decade New Approach, and then it, it fell by the wayside because COVID took over. Um, that would be 
uh, showing fidelity to the Good Friday Agreement. There was a civic forum in the Good Friday Agreement that was allowed to wither on the vine and then the DUP and Sinn Féin didn't want to re-establish it again. That is as much a part of the Good Friday Agreement uh, as yeah. all of the other bits and pieces. So you could establish, this government could, could establish the Civic Advisory Panel as a standalone body that exists with or without the devolved <coughs> institutions um, and they can keep this conversation going and speak with the public to find out how much appetite there is for various degrees of institutional reform. And the final thing I'll say on that is um, Professor Remick is absolutely right that consociational power sharing systems are very difficult to change, but they are changeable. We have had institutional reforms of our system over the years. We used to have 108 MLAs, now we have 90. We didn't used to have provisions for an opposition, mm -hmm. now we do. I was reading a book the other day by um, an academic called Camille Bidoc, who wrote this um, excellent book about institutional engineering. And even systems that look very, very concrete and immovable, they can change. They usually change when the reform is bottom up, when it's, it's, there's pressure from below that confronts the, the, yeah, the, the reluctance um, at the political elite level. And we've, we've reached the end of the road of reforming our institutions by political leaders. Mm -hmm. Some of the time, are those reforms, if you think of St Andrews, they've had unintended consequences because it's left the party political leaders to cook up behind closed doors. I think we've reached the end of the road for that. We need to establish <laughs> mechanisms for civic society to have a, a, a significant voice in this. Um, and unless that happens, we're not going to get institutional reform because there's too many people that benefit out of the current system. So can I just say, I, yes, I, please. I, I completely agree with that. But at the same time, you cannot use these sorts of processes to circumvent mm. po politicians uh, and political parties and the need to build consensus across the parties. Uh, you know the, the the fact that I mean we don't have the DUP or the or Sinn Féin in the room presently. Mm. They both clearly matter a great deal. Mm. Yeah. Um, and you, 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 the, these kinds of processes can help the process of the process of the parties coming together and need to be designed carefully in order to enable that. But they can't be used to just try to get past the parties. But, but, uh, and absolutely, except that they matter a great deal and you have to have the engagement of, 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 of both the, those traditions and indeed the key parties. Um, but uh, uh, it's not inconceivable that within the next few years we could be in a situation in which those are no longer the two biggest parties um, in the Assembly. And if the one of the biggest parties in the Assembly were one which did not identify with one of the major traditions, then there's a clear case at that point that you have to have reform of the institutions that would allow it to, that things to function possibly. I guess the question is partly, should talks and conversations and civic dialogue be attempting to preempt that, or should people be waiting until that happens? <laughs> Well, no, we should certainly be discussing that, uh, as I said. And, and just to endorse Sean's point, uh, I think it is very important to bring civic society into the discussion more about this, but about, about a wide range of issues. Um, I, I, having tried to sort of engage people in various initiatives over the years, successfully with Pivotal, less successfully with others, there is a strong resistance among a lot of people outside politics, I think, to putting their heads above the parapet because at times they've got them chewed off by politicians, devolved politicians, and those are people often with uh, great influence, great largesse at their disposal. So it becomes, you know, if you're a leader of a business, you will hesitate to, to, to pipe up and say, no, that's wrong. Yep. The governments could, could provide forums, whatever the institutional form, uh, in which that is encouraged rather more. And I think, you know, at times that has been a very positive force. Um, and you know, forces for encouraging constructive politics at the moment are rather missing. Mm. Thank you. Let's turn now to Claire Hannah. Thank you very much. Um, this has been really interesting and enjoyed your, your, your submissions as well. A nice afternoon of nerding out to, to, to <laughs> build on your uh, earlier. I mean, um, just picking up on, on what Bob and Robin were asking, I mean, I happen to think the, the core defects and, and the sort of most urgent areas for action are around veto and general disincentive 
uh, to compromise, including those issues around the St Andrews changes and the privatisation of first minister elections and all that. Um, uh, but I, 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 I do think symbolically, at least, the the designation is 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 problematic. I have, that's new. I think I remember when I was a new MLA, Sean doing a, a, an interview with you in about 2015 a, a, about exactly this. Right. Uh, and and while. I, I'll always take the opportunity to reiterate it. I'm not saying people are saying it in this room, but it is not regressive or uh, irrational to have a view on the constitutional issue. And certainly, while the UK has been having this tremendous meltdown and the Republic of Ireland um, is, is booming, it is certainly rational and Northern Ireland isn't working um, uh, for, for, for people to, to want to pursue that. So, so I would separate the symbolic act of you know dividing into sheep and goats as your very first thing you you do um, as an MLA with with the the, the 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 perfect validity of having constitutional views, but I think it is um, essentially bad crack, and I think it, it puts people off, and I think it just foregrounds uh, constitutional and indeed process issues. So um, I, I'm I'm interested in how you. Um, think we would step away from that because somebody used the analogy earlier about pulling a thread and and, and all that and it's not just as simple maybe as deleting it out um, because obviously um, that, that has implications. We have advocated and put down amendments on the MEPOC bill uh, around looking at say two thirds thresholds and, and qualified majorities and all that sort of stuff as alternatives to, um, to 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 the waiting. So I just w- w- wonder how you think you should we would address that. You you said Alan about you know it is discriminated against because it doesn't have a veto. To me, the way to address that is to level down, take the veto off others rather than uh, add the veto. That that's the way. So I I think there's almost too much focus on it, but also um, it is worth. Um, it, it, it is still worth, um, at the very least, toning down um, the impact of designation, and I'm interested in how you think we would do that. Would you? Who, who would? Who would particularly like to do that one? I, I mean, it, it, it's not straightforward. As people said, you, you know, there will be a, a great deal of institutional resistance. I suppose from the two main parties. Who Even are, if, no, if, assume. Let's let's oh, like. Fair, how, how, fair, sorry, fair, I just I just fair, want to clarify. Fair, We're going to come on. To, can I just can I finish my point? We're going to come on to the process, but let's not start the conversation with D P and Sinn Féin won't let it, so we can't. Let's talk about how it should happen, and then we can get on to. No, but but that, that, that is why I perhaps rather feebly earlier suggested that the, the starting point is at least to have more public discussion, mm-hmm. more expert, because you know the, the experts on the institutional questions generally tend to be people within the institutions or within parties, uh, not really within academia. There has been quite little public discussion, and we could usefully have, have more of that and more ideas ventilated, and then you know they may uh, acquire a political, uh, 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 a political impetus of their own. The other thing is, of course, the political crisis is the time when these things mm. may happen. I, I was suggesting you know, we, we may... I, I think it, it is an imperative to get the institutions back up and running in some form quite soon because lots of government isn't being done and the long-term damage is very serious. And the absence of, of, of government completely is, you know, traditionally the absence of politics, a political vacuum, has always been bad for all sorts of reasons. I and mean, doesn't want to talk them up, but they are there. There is potentially a benign, a malign scenario in which we lose slowly over time a lot of the gains of the of the agreement if the institutions can't come back. So I would argue that it is important to bring them back in some form, uh, and I say there are legitimacy issues over that, so you would do it temporarily while you, you, you continue then to have discussions with the parties about how to how to move forward, but those might be institutions, you know, with a di- and, and I suggested in, in the paper, I think there would be an argument there because you would have to set up a government that would be able to get its business through the assembly. The, the obvious way to move is, in fact, towards a weighted majority threshold system uh, and have that running on a temporary basis uh, for both selection, for formation of the executive and for votes within it. Uh, and in that way, you might get an executive Reason, still reasonably representative. It, I, politically, it would be crucial whether you get the UUP in if the DUP were, 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 were intent on staying out, but which could then operate as an executive and could carry its business through. Uh, this all assuming the DUP doesn't decide to come again. So, so you mean basically, and I and I am kind of assuming that we, we you know, that we're doing this from a place of, of restoration. I was thinking that Homer Simpson. It's been X days since our last disaster. So even even <laughs> even if and when, hopefully we we, we we come back this this spring. Um, 
looking at these, you think you'd need to transition. Uh, obviously, there's no question that we would have designation gone before um, uh, we, we come back. But how, how do you how do you still manage power sharing and executive formation um, if people aren't designating? Is what I'm asking. Uh, is there a way? To well, do I, I was. I, I'm sorry. This was slightly the other way around. It's if we don't get the DUP coming yeah, yeah. back well, into these yeah, yeah. institutions, then I think there, there would be a, a, a good case for a, a, a government in which designation did not apply. So you would, you would have some sort of majority voting mm. system okay. for securing at least the top jobs, the FM, DFM. I daringly suggested that actually if you're moving away from... Uh, there, there is a case for three joint first ministers uh, which at least gets your, you know, which sounds absurd, but I mean... Third time! <laughs> well, in a sense, the absurdity is moving away from having one leader of a government, isn't it? And once you've got there, having two suggests... Once you've got two, you might as well have three. It, well... Uh, My wife and I had the same discussion about children, so it, there, there, is, there, is, um, there is form on this. For everybody in the audience. Exactly. Says, it's, it's, exactly. it's difficult otherwise to, to say you are completely representative of a community, because I mean, ultimately, the, the, the first minister and deputy first minister have, a, 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 at the moment, a, a veto effectively over, over over government policy. Difficult to say you're completely representative of all groups in society. If you don't, but that, that's that's another question. But you you would have a way to majority system for selecting them, and a way to majority system then for them to get their their key votes through the assembly. Otherwise, you know, the the the, 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 the party staying out, if sufficiently large, yeah, could stymie. Yeah. Uh, all government, and it is very important we get government with an agenda and that carries through the necessary reforms. And at a minimum, just kind of following on from what Alan was saying, I think, and, and Professor Remick's absolutely right that you know we can't, particularly with the with power sharing government, we can't step over political leaders as frustrating as the the vetoes may be. Reforming the system without political yeah. buy-in from them, you know, the new system won't have legitimacy. Um, the DUP fought the election. They wouldn't go back into the executive until the protocol was resolved to their satisfaction. Fair enough. What we could think about is, as a, a minimum, is reforming the rule for electing a speaker, mm -hmm. so that the weighted majority cross-community voting rules apply for everything else. But for a speaker, we can elect a speaker by a, a simplified supermajority, say 65%. Mm. So if that had have happened, we would have had a speaker in May because um, Patsy McGlone got 71% support. That included support from unionists, nationalists, and others. And that crucially would have meant that the assembly would have been able to form, the committee system would have been able to form, yes. and we wouldn't have had caretaker ministers in office without organised accountability mechanisms, mechanisms holding into account. That's just un untenable. People think that caretaker ministers don't have any power. That's nonsense. They don't have any new power. Mm -hmm. But they were in office for six months or, or thereabouts with no assembly to hold them to account. So there's a democratic case for reforming just the rule for electing the speaker so that we can have an assembly for when we don't have executives but we do have a caretaker minister. I reckon we've got... Yeah. Three, four minutes. Yeah. Oh, uh, we've got three. We've got, well, we've got three. Well, uh, for, for what it's worth, uh, you may be aware, we, yeah, we formally it. made that proposal about the Speaker. We've, we've written to the Secretary yeah, of State and to the parties and it's are democracy. engaging with those who, who, who wish to engage on it. Uh, you, you briefly touched on, on, on the public opinion. Maybe you could just clarify what we do know uh, uh, about that. You know, kind of, can you... Can you Quantify it, you know the, the the percentage, and obviously it it, it it's only polling and, and focus grouping or, or or whatever. But how substantial that is, and how you think it would be good to approach it. Bear in mind that you know the agreement was broadly negotiated and endorsed by the people, and for example, the changes at, at St Andrews and elsewhere were done over the heads of the people as well as over some of the parties. So mm. so, so so those who would gatekeep haven't been that purist about inclusion uh, t to date. But um, so w with that idea of bottom up, essentially, of, of demonstrating the weight of public opinion and, and mm -hmm. essentially nudging some of the, the more recalcitrant uh, uh, interests, uh, w how substantial is that public opinion? And yeah. how do you think is it, it should be approached? What would be the next steps to building the case for reform? OK, um, so on the question of whether the institution should be reformed, I think about 65 to 70 percent of the people are in favour of institutional reform. Now we're limited by survey questions in terms of you can't make them too complicated because yeah, you lose, you'll lose people. Um, the Institute of Irish Studies had a survey um, last year um, about how the reform process should come about. 
72% of people thought that there should be a citizens' assembly first, or a series of citizens', citizens assemblies to kind of flesh that out. Um, and then about 80% of people thought that you know, when this is eventually fleshed out that there should be a referendum on it. Referendum needs to be at the very, very end of a, a very long and deliberative process that has political buy-in. Um, so people, there's a public appetite out there for discussions about institutional reform. When we in the Citizens' Assembly talked about voluntary coalition, most people thought that Northern Ireland was not yet ready for a voluntary coalition and wanted some safeguards. And if you have safeguards, then sometimes that necessitates designation. Plus, if we use cross, if we're using cross-community vote for the for the Stormont break, this might be baked in and locked in for a while anyway. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, yeah. It's one of those things yes. people like the sound of, but that's what I'm yeah. saying when you actually start to unpick it. I think, uh, and if anybody's got some burning pithy three-worder to come in, I would just say remember that there are minority communities that will find this kind of thing very hard, and they need to be thought of as well. Yeah. Well, for a session that's taken us from um, high uh, nerdery through to Homer Simpson, um, uh, can I thank our panel, second panel, this afternoon? Thank you for taking our questions. You've given us a lot to think about. Order, order. Thank you. The proceeding has ended.